Introduction The Soviet Union experienced a period of political turmoil at the end of the 1930s. This escalated in a series of trials known as the Moscow Trials. Nowadays the trials are often characterized as fraudulent, that the accused were innocent of all wrongdoings and victims of frame-ups. What is the reality of this situation? Is there any validity to these claims? For this video, I will be discussing the events leading up to the trials and then the Moscow trials themselves. Background 1927 to 1928 Party debates and factional struggles In the 10th Party Congress, Lenin had proposed a ban on factional groupings inside the party as they went against the organizing principles of Bolshevism, democratic centralism. Democratic centralism means that on any given topic, everyone has freedom of speech to express their opinion, but once a decision is reached, everyone must uphold the rule of the majority. If, after having lost a debate on any given issue, a factional grouping still continued to insist on their own policy, despite the party majority deciding against it, they would probably be expelled from the party. Either accept the party's principles, or be expelled. Quote, in the practical struggle against factionalism, every organization of the party must take strict measures to prevent all factional actions, ensure strict discipline within the party and in all Soviet work, and to secure maximum unanimity in eliminating all factionalism. Lenin, summing up speech on party unity and the anarcho-syndicalist deviation. Lenin's ban on factions led to the suppression of various kinds of factional activities from the syndicalists, Trotskyists, the left communist faction led by Bukharin, and other groups. These groupings were forced to accept democratic centralism and party discipline if they wanted to stay in the party. We move forward to 1927, when Stalin has outmaneuvered his opponents. His policies are being accepted, he is recognized as the rightful leader of the party, and the majority backs him. Trotsky's left opposition has been ideologically defeated. Zinoviev and Kaminev who previously had been going back and forth about supporting Trotsky, make an alliance of convenience with him and his supporters. This group becomes known as the United Opposition. An opposition grouping is tolerated within the party for a while, but in October 1927, the United Opposition stages a demonstration, separate from the rest of the Bolshevik party, officially to commemorate the revolution, but also to criticize the political line of the party majority and the Central Committee led by Stalin. This is recognized as factionalism by the party, and many members of the United Opposition are forced to self-criticize or be expelled. Zinoviev and Kaminev capitulate and are allowed to stay. Trotsky refuses and is expelled. He is deported from the country a year later. In exile, Trotsky begins to write books and articles against the Soviet Union's current leadership. He accuses the Soviet government of various wrongdoings and claims that he himself should have become the leader. Trotsky's Conspiracy Illegal Bolshevik-Leninist Underground Inside the USSR, 1932 Quote, One fights repression by means of anonymity and conspiracy. Letter from Trotsky to set off. The opposition led by Trotsky would eventually be accused of treason, espionage, and running an illegal anti-Soviet underground organization inside the USSR in the Moscow trials. Trotsky denied all charges, and famously claimed that all the accusations were merely inventions of Stalin. In 1980, the preeminent Trotsky's researcher, Pierre Bruet, was granted access to the Harvard Trotsky archive. There he made a startling discovery. Among other documents, he found items of correspondence between Trotsky, his son Leon Sedov, and Trotsky's secretary, Von Heijnort. In this correspondence, Bruet found that Trotsky and his allies were discussing first the formation and then the running of a secret organization inside the Soviet Union. This corroborated the Soviet accusation, at least to some degree. More shocking to a devoted Trotskyist like Bruet was that Trotsky and Sedov had lied to all their supporters, indeed the entire world. The opposition bloc of Trotskyists, turns out, was entirely real not a Stalinist invention. It was then discovered that the Harvard Trotsky archive had been purged, items had been removed, 
This was a closed archive, meaning that only certain Trotskyist researchers had been previously given access, mainly Isaac Deutscher, who wrote a massive biography on Trotsky's life. Trotsky's wife had also been given access. They formed the most obvious candidates for the censoring of the archive of sensitive materials. Quote, the proposal for a block seems to me completely acceptable. Letter from Trotsky to Sedov. Quote, the block is organized. It includes the Zinovievists, the Sten Laminazi group, and the Trotskyists, former capitulators. The Safar Tarkin group have not yet formally entered. They have too extreme a position. They will enter very soon. Letter from Sedov to Trotsky. Quote, as far as the illegal organization of the Bolshevik Leninists inside the USSR is concerned, only the first steps have been taken towards its reorganization. Trotsky, December 16, 1932. Bolshevik Leninist was a term used by Trotsky for his own supporters, Trotskyists. Bruet's findings were published in his book, The Block of the Opposition Against Stalin. Despite the fact that this was a truly bombshell revelation, these findings were not given much attention. Many Trotskyists deny the existence of the bloc to this very day. Mainstream historians also largely continue to imply that the bloc was Stalin's invention and fabricated. The discovery did spark interest in the new school of Soviet studies among historians like J. Arch Getty, who also visited the Trotsky archive and came to the conclusion that it had been censored. But if the materials left in the archive proved at least part of the allegations at the Moscow trial, what about the missing materials? Trotsky, his son, and his secretary vehemently denied the existence of the bloc, claiming it to be a Stalinist lie. Trotsky's secretary never mentioned it in his memoirs written well after Trotsky's death. Same goes for perhaps Trotsky's biggest advocate, Isaac Deutscher, who was allowed to go through the archives, yet continued to insist there was no secret underground organization or bloc. This is what they said publicly. Quote, of course the Russian Bolshevik Leninists didn't enter into any kind of bloc. Set off the Red Book. While this was what they said amongst themselves secretly. Quote, the proposal for a bloc seems to me completely acceptable. Letter from Trotsky to Sedov. The bloc is organized. Letter from Sedov to Trotsky. Naturally, anyone will profess innocence, regardless if they're actually innocent or guilty. All this demonstrates is that Trotsky's claims of innocence are worthless. Certainly he was running an illegal organization inside the USSR. As for the other charges, it will have to be determined based on evidence. Quote, the indictment dates the conclusion of the bloc in 1932 as the starting point of the terrorist activity of the accused. From their side, Trotsky and Sedov did not the bloc even existed. Pierre Bruet, the bloc of the opposition against Stalin. Quote, it is clear, then, that Trotsky did have a clandestine organization inside the USSR in this period, and that he maintained communication with it. It is equally clear that a united oppositional bloc was formed in 1932. Getty, Origins of the Great Purges. Political Assassinations Murder of Sergei Kirov, 1934 Quote Stalin must be killed, Leon said off. Quote, Stalin is crushing the country. Implacable hatred is accumulating around him, and a terrible vengeance hangs over his head. An assassination attempt? It is possible that this regime will ultimately suffer individual terror. One can add that it would be contrary to the laws of history that the gangsters in power not be subjected to acts of vengeance. Leon Trotsky in 1934, head of the Leningrad organization of the Soviet Communist Party, Sergei Kirov, was assassinated by a gunman. The killer, a member of the party, Leonid Nikolaev, attempted to commit suicide before being captured, but failed. In the interrogation, he initially claimed to be a lone gunman, but eventually testified to being part of a conspiracy of political assassinations by the underground Trotskyist Zinoviavite bloc. In response to these grave allegations, Trotsky accused Stalin of masterminding the murder himself. However, there is no evidence to justify Trotsky's claim. Both Khrushchevite de-Stalinization and Gorbachev's glasnost era researchers attempted to compile evidence that Stalin killed Kirov 
but nothing was found. In fact, Kirov was a close collaborator of Stalin's and naturally would be a target for politically motivated terrorists. Quote, Over the years, there were three, and perhaps four, blue ribbon investigations of the Kirov killing. Khrushchev and Gorbachev wanted to pin it on Stalin, and all of them handpicked their investigators accordingly. Having been able to acquaint myself with the archival materials from these efforts, it is clear that none of the three investigations produced the desired conclusions. In particular, the Khrushchev and Gorbachev era efforts involved massive combing of archives and interviews and failed to conclude that Stalin was behind the killing. Stalin's effort, of course, concluded that the opposition did it and was the basis for the Moscow trials. Arch Getty, 2000. There was no obvious reason why Stalin would have wanted to falsely accuse the oppositionists of this crime at this point. Consider, the Trotskyist underground bloc had not been uncovered yet. Certainly Stalin had no idea that Zinoviev, Kamenev, etc. were members in it. It was largely the Kirov murder that sparked the investigation leading to those discoveries. The oppositionists were politically powerless and marginalized in the legal party and state apparatus of the USSR. They had no chance to challenge Stalin's political line. They would have only been dangerous in one capacity, as members of an illegal anti-Soviet conspiracy. However, Stalin did not know of any such conspiracy at the time. He did not even know the opposition bloc truly existed until it was discovered by the NKVD in connection with the Kirov investigation. Is it conceivable that one of the leaders of the party gets shot by a lone gunman? It is within the realm of possibility. But considering the facts, other options seem far more likely. There is no good evidence to doubt Nikolaev's admission of guilt. One could merely say that it alone is inconclusive. After the Kirov murder and the discovery of the secret bloc of Trotskyists, the charges against the conspirators kept on mounting. Zinoviev and Kamenev were among the first to be tried already arrested in connection with the Kirov murder. However, they would be tried in connection with a broader conspiracy to overthrow the government. The charges against the defendants included sabotage, espionage, conspiring with foreign powers, and planning and committing political assassinations. Alexander Zinoviev, no relation to Grigory Zinoviev, was a political dissident in the USSR and was eventually exiled from the country. In 1939, he was accused of a plot to murder Stalin as part of an underground organization, but was eventually released. He spoke of those years after the fall of the Soviet Union, actually admitting to his guilt. Quote, I was already a confirmed anti-Stalinist at the age of 17. The idea of killing Stalin filled my thoughts and feelings. We studied the technical possibilities of an attack. We even practiced. If they had condemned me to death in 1939, their decision would have been just. I had made up a plan to kill Stalin. Wasn't that a crime? When Stalin was still alive, I saw things differently. Until Stalin's death, I was an anti-Stalinist. Alexander Zinoviev, The Remorse of a Dissident The fact that he was arrested by the NKVD, but released due to lack of conclusive evidence or confession, argues against the idea that the oppositionists were merely framed by the Soviet government. Not only was Alexander Zinoviev released, and therefore not framed, but he also admits his guilt, being an unwitting part of an underground group. This seems to demonstrate that the investigation was fair. The accused was innocent, until proven guilty. Clearly the notion of political assassinations was not invented by Stalin. Alexander Zinoviev admits his guilt. He wasn't tortured into confessing by the NKVD. The NKVD doesn't even exist anymore. Despite their best efforts, Khrushchev, Gorbachev, capitalists, no one, has been able to find any evidence that Stalin had Kirov killed. Trotsky's claim is therefore false. Nikolaev, the assassin, confessed to being part of an opposition group, exactly like Alexander Zinoviev did. Mark Zborovsky, an NKVD agent, managed to infiltrate Trotsky's organization and actually became Sedov's second in command. He reported to Moscow that Sedov and his followers were planning assassinations of Stalin and Voroshilov. Quote, Trotsky's and Sedov's staffs were thoroughly infiltrated, and Sedov's closest collaborator in 1936, Mark Zborowski, is said to have been an NKVD agent. In 1936, the 1932 bloc would be interpreted by the NKVD as a terrorist plot. Getty, Origins. Jules Humbert Droz, a Swiss communist 
and political ally of Bukharin, wrote in his memoirs about their last meeting in 1929. Bukharin had told him that they were planning to assassinate Stalin. He had objected, and they had split over this. His memoirs were published in 1971, well after de-Stalinization had claimed Bukharin was innocent. Quote, Before leaving, I went to see Bukharin for the last time, not knowing whether I would see him again upon my return. We had a long and frank conversation. He brought me up to date with the contacts made by his group with the zinoviev kamine fraction in order to coordinate the struggle against the power of Stalin. I did not hide from him that I did not approve of this liaison of the oppositions. The struggle against Stalin is not a political program. This bloc is without principles which will crumble away before achieving any results. Bukharin also told me that they had decided to utilize individual terror in order to rid themselves of Stalin. On this point as well I expressed my reservations. Bukharin doubtlessly had understood that I would not bind myself blindly to his fraction, whose sole program was to make Stalin disappear. This was our last meeting. G. A. Tokayev was a member of a conspiratorial anti-communist group within the Soviet Red Army, who defected to the British in 1948. He wrote about his activities openly and unrepentantly. His group was connected to other opposition underground groups, met with Bukharin, and knew about the Trotskyist Zinoviavite conspiracy against Kirov in Leningrad. Quote, Stalin aimed at one-party dictatorship and complete centralization. Bukharin envisaged several parties and even nationalist parties, and stood for the maximum of decentralization. By 1936, Bukharin was approaching the social democratic standpoint of the left-wing socialists of the West. Tokayev, Comrade X, quote, Bukharin wanted us to act with greater determination. We were to snatch the initiative from the hands of the Stalin, Molotov, Kirov, Triumvirate. Tokayev, Betrayal of an Ideal. Tokayev unrepentantly said that Kirov brought the assassination upon himself by his work against the Zinoviavites in Leningrad and purging the party of right-wingers. Quote, the principal initiators of the 1933 purge were Stalin and Kirov, and of the two, Kirov was the more responsible. He had already tried out purging in his own sphere in Leningrad. Indeed, that is what cost him his life. I have good reason to put on record that it was not in 1934, as the official Kremlin reports of the trial of the so-called Leningrad Center suggest, but in the spring of 1933 that his assassination was first mooted, and that by men who should have known better. It was not remarkable that the oppositionists of Leningrad fastened their hatred on him, when the assassin Nikolaev, at his first cross-examination, declared that the Leningrad opposition had its own special accounts to settle with Kirov, he was only being just. Tokayev, Ibid. Quote, Our group had planned to assassinate Kirov and Kalinin, the president of the Soviet Union. Finally, it was another group that assassinated Kirov. In 1934, there was a plot to start a revolution by arresting the whole of the Stalinist Pact 17th Congress of the party. A comrade from the group, Klava Erimenko, proposed in mid-1936 to kill Stalin. There had already been no less than 15 attempts to assassinate Stalin. None had got near to success. Each had cost many brave lives. Tokayev, Comrade X. The right-wing conspirators of Tokayev regretted that Bukharin was caught. The Trotskyist Radek gave himself up and confessed to the NKVD. Quote, Radek provided the culminating evidence on which Bukharin was arrested, tried and shot. We had known of Radek's treachery at least a fortnight before, Bukharin's arrest on October 16, 1936, and we tried to save Bukharin. Tokayev, Comrade X. Discovery of the Trotskyist Organization, 1935 to 1936. The NKVD makes a startling discovery. Inside the Soviet Union, there exists a secret Trotskyite Zinovievite underground, conspiring to overthrow the Soviet government. Naturally, everyone knew there were ex Trotskyists, opposition groups, and other similar forces in the country. However, this new group was different. It was an illegal conspiratorial bloc, not a political opposition. Also shocking was that the old opposition leaders, like Zinoviev and Kamenev, were among its leaders, together with ex-Trotskyists, like Smirnov. Indeed, these ex-Trotskyists 
where in reality still Trotsky is, only secretly. Trotsky continued to claim that he had no agreement with the oppositionists and had no contact with them since 1927. This turned out to be false. The bloc itself was in routine contact with Trotsky. Much of the NKVD investigative materials are still classified in Russia, so we do not know all the evidence they had. We have some of the testimonies describing the Trotsky's bloc, its contact with Trotsky, and naming some of its members, which are confirmed by the materials from the Harvard Trotsky archive. Zinoviev, Kaminev, Priobrazhensky, Smirnov, and others were directly named as members of the conspiratorial bloc in Trotsky's correspondence, discovered by Trotsky's historian Pierre Brouet. Radek and Sokolnikov were named in mailing receipts of Trotsky's correspondence, which were discovered in the Trotsky archive by Getty. The actual letters had been removed from the archive by a person or persons unknown before it was opened to researchers. Quote, the left opposition was always an intransient opponent of behind-the-scenes combinations and agreements. For it, the question of a bloc could only consist of an openly political act in full view of the masses, based on its political platform. The history of the 13-year struggle of the left opposition is proof of that. Set off. The Red Book. Chapter 9. Quote, this text, written right after the first Moscow trial, stands in complete contradiction to the 1932 document in secret ink and in Sedov's handwriting, and that attests to the existence of the bloc and of the negotiations he was carrying on with the Trotskyists in the USSR, with Trotsky's letter approving the formation of the bloc as an alliance, not a unification, and with the comments of Trotsky. Brue, the bloc of the opposition against Stalin. Quote, on July 11, 1928, during the violent debates that took place before the collectivization, Bukharin held a clandestine meeting with Kamenev. He stated that he was ready to give up Stalin for Kamenev and Zinoviev, and hoped for a bloc to remove Stalin. Foundations of a Planned Economy, Edward Hallett Carr and R. W. Davies. In his confession, Bukharin said, quote, The trio, Bukharin, Rykov, Tomsky, became an illegal counter-revolutionary organization. Close to this illegal center was Yanukids, who had contact with this center through Tomsky. About the autumn of 1932, the next stage in the development of the right organization began, namely the transition to tactics of a forcible overthrow of Soviet power. Terrorism, steering a course for a direct alliance with the Trotskyites. Around this time, the idea of a palace coup was maturing in the right circles, this was when the political bloc with Kamenev and Zinoviev originated. In this period, we had meetings also with Sertsov and Lominatze. In the summer of 1932, Pyotrkov told me of his meetings with Sedov concerning Trotsky's policy of terrorism. Report of court proceedings in the case of the anti-Soviet bloc of rights and Trotskyites. We can be certain Bukharin spoke fairly accurately, as even evidence outside the Soviet archives corroborates it. Zinoviev and Kamenev, Lominatze, etc., were named in Trotsky's letters, which were discovered in 1980. Yanukids is confirmed as a member of the right-wing conspiracy also by Tokayev. Tukhachevsky Affair and Military Conspiracy 1936 Quote, You are wrong to tie the fate of our country to countries which are old and finished, such as France and Britain. We ought to turn towards new Germany. Germany will assume the leading position on the continent of Europe. Marshal Tukhachevsky Quote, Pro-German statements made by Tukhachevsky in Western European countries during his trip to Britain became known in France and Czechoslovakia. The information that such an important figure as Tukhachevsky took a pro-German stand caused grave concerns in Paris and Prague. The two governments notified the Soviet government about Tukhachevsky's statements. Yuri Yemelyanov the Tukhachevsky Conspiracy. Quote, the Moscow press announced that the generals accused had been in pay of Hitler and had agreed to help him get Ukraine. This charge was fairly widely believed in foreign military circles and was later substantiated by revelations made abroad. Czech military circles seemed to be especially well informed. Czech officials in Prague bragged to me later that their military men had been the first to discover and to complain to Moscow that Czech military secrets, known to the Russians, 
through the Mutual Aid Alliance, were being revealed by Tukhachevsky to the German High Command. Anna Strong, the Soviets expected it. Quote, People of the French Deuxième Bureau told me long ago that Tukhachevsky was pro-German, and the Czechs told me the extraordinary story of Tukhachevsky's visit to Prague, when towards the end of the banquet he had got rather drunk, he blurted out that an agreement with Hitler was the only hope for both Czechoslovakia and Russia, and he then proceeded to abuse Stalin. The Czechs did not fail to report this to the Kremlin, and that was the end of Tukhachevsky, and of so many of his followers. Alexander Worth Quoted in Harpal Brar's Perestroika, The Complete Collapse of Revisionism. The NKVD discovered a network of traitors inside the Soviet Red Army, centered around Marshal Tukhachevsky. In his letter, Marshal Budyani describes the interrogation of one of the members of the military conspiracy. Quote, Primakov very stubbornly denied that he led a terrorist group consisting of Schmidt Kuzmichev against Kam Varshilov. He denied this on the basis that he said Trotsky had entrusted him, Primakov, with a more serious task, to organize an armed uprising in Leningrad. Primakov did not, however, deny that he had indeed earlier led a terrorist group, and for that purpose had recommended Schmidt to the post of commander of the mechanized corps. In connection with this special assignment of Trotsky's, Primakov worked on the 25th Cavalry Division with the divisional commander Zibin. According to him, Zibin was assigned to meet Trotsky at the border once the rebels had taken over Leningrad. Letter from Marshal Budyani to Commissar for Defense, Clement Voroshilov, 1937. Both Voroshilov and Budyani were close associates of Stalin's. If they had framed Tukhachevsky together, they would not discuss the investigation in the manner they do. Also, if accused Primakov was framed he would probably not insist that he was not currently a member of a terrorist group, but instead a military conspiratorial one, as both are equally illegal. On top of that, Primakov admits to being part of a terrorist group previously, just not currently. This lends credibility to his testimony. Both the investigative materials and Budyani's letter were never intended for publication and didn't come out until decades later, so lying in them would be pointless. In this connection, the Schwernik report should be mentioned. It was a report compiled by a Khrushchev-era commission whose goal was to gather materials that could be used to disprove the guilt of Tukhachevsky, to prove that Stalin had framed him. Unfortunately for Khrushchev, the commission failed to find such evidence, but instead it found further evidence of Tukhachevsky's guilt. Among some of the materials discussed in the Schwernik report is a telegram from a Japanese military attaché to his superior in Japan, testifying to a secret contact with a representative of Marshal Tukhachevsky, corroborating the Moscow trial testimony. The Schwernik report went unpublished at the time, as it didn't achieve what Khrushchev wanted it to. The notion that there could have been a military conspiracy is deemed unbelievable by Trotskyists and anti-communists. They dismiss evidence against Tukhachevsky and say his testimony cannot be trusted. I will point out the case of General Vlasov, who defected from the Red Army to the German side in 1941, saying he wanted to, quote, build a new Russia without Bolsheviks or capitalists, end of quote. This is similar to Tukhachevsky's rhetoric. Vlasov was never arrested by the Soviets and gave the testimony of his own volition from the safety of the West. Another such example was Tokayev, who defected to the British. The case file of Tukhachevsky is still classified. The last person known to have read it is Colonel Viktor Alkaznes, relative of one of the people involved in the trial. He said, quote, My grandfather and Tukhachevsky were friends, and grandfather was on the judicial panel that judged both Tukhachevsky and Eidemann. My interest in this case became even stronger after the well-known publications of Procurer Viktorov, who wrote that Jakob Alkaznes was very active at the trial, harassed the accused. But in the trial transcript, everything was just the opposite. Grandfather only asked two or three questions during the entire trial. But the strangest thing is the behavior of the accused. Newspaper accounts claim that all the defendants denied their guilt completely. But according to the transcript, they fully admitted their guilt. I realized that an admission of guilt itself can be the result of torture, but in the transcript it was something else entirely. A huge amount of detail, long dialogues, accusations of one another, a mass of precision, 
It is simply impossible to stage manage something like this. I know nothing about the nature of the conspiracy, but of the fact that there really did exist a conspiracy within the Red Army and that Tukhachevsky participated in it, I'm completely convinced today. Colonel Alkasnes, Elementi 2000 From a further interview of Alkasnes by Vladimir Bobrov Alkasnes, I turned the pages of the transcript and had more questions than answers. I came away with the impression that, obviously, there had really been a conspiracy. But this is what struck me. In the transcripts, there are parts which attest to the sincerity of what the defendants said. No matter who claims the trial was an organized show, that they worked on the defendant specially, so that they would have given necessary confessions. Imagine this. Let's say Tukhachevsky is telling about a meeting with the German military attaché in a dacha near Moscow, and at that moment Primakov interrupts him and says, Mikhail Nikolaevich, you are mistaken. This meeting did not take place in your office at the dacha, but it was on the veranda. I think it would have been impossible to direct things such that Tukhachevsky said precisely that, and that Primakov would then make a correction like that. Bobrov Very well, but was there anything that made you think that the trial had been scripted and directed anyway? Alkasnis No, it would have been impossible to script and direct a trial such as that in the transcript. Bobrov That is, you wish to state that, having read the transcript, you did not find in it any traces of any kind of staging. Alkasnis Yes, yes. On top of that, all of them confessed, and when they all admitted guilt in their last words, stating that they had been participating in the conspiracy, and knowing that after that execution awaited them, it is just impossible to imagine that they forced them all to make such admissions and declarations. Bobrov What was the main point of accusation of the conspirators? Alksnes Everything was there. Espionage, preparation for a military coup. Sabotage, wrecking. Bobrov. And what does espionage mean? You were talking about the meeting at the dacha. Alksnes. Yes, yes, with the German military attaché. They were talking about arranging coordination with the German military. Contacts were going on with them. Bobrov. One last question. In your interview with Elementi, you talked about some kind of cannon that might shoot at our own times from back in the 30s. What did you have in mind? Alksnes. If an objective research project on the events of those years were to be done, free of ideological dogmas, then a great deal could change in our attitude towards those years and towards the personalities of that epoch, and that would be a bomb that would cause some problems. During the last years of his life, Long after de-Stalinization, Molotov spoke about this issue in an interview with Felix Shuev, published in 1993, as Molotov remembers. The Khrushchev government had made de-Stalinization official policy. Similarly, in the Gorbachev years, it was political suicide to oppose the anti-Stalin line. However, Molotov did so anyway. He testified to the accuracy of the trial findings. Quote, The right wing already had a channel to Hitler, even before this. Trotsky was definitely connected to him. That's beyond any doubt. Many of the ranking military officers were also involved. That goes without saying. Quote, Chuev. He, Tukhachevsky, was accused of being a German agent. Molotov. He hurried with plans for a coup. Both Krasinski and Rosengolds testified to that. It makes sense. He feared he was at the point of being arrested and could no longer put things off and there was no one else he could rely on except the Germans. This sequence of events is plausible. I consider Tukhachevsky a most dangerous conspirator in the military who was caught only at the last minute. Had he not been apprehended, the consequences could have been catastrophic. He was most popular in the army. Did everyone who was charged or executed take part in the conspiracy hatched by Tukhachevsky? Some were certainly involved, but as to whether Tukhachevsky and his group in the military were connected with Trotskyists, and rightists, and were preparing a coup, there is no doubt. Molotov remembers. Is it really likely that Molotov was lying? For what possible reason? To defend himself? Surely not. These kinds of statements not only went against the Western narrative, but also the Gorbachev government's narrative. Some will portray Molotov as a careerist, 
a hopeless yes-man who agreed to all of Stalin's proposals merely to stay in power. But here he was, attesting to the correctness of their policies, even though he had nothing to gain from doing so. Quite the opposite. Obviously, he must have believed he was telling the truth, and he chose to tell it, even if it meant trouble for him. Choyev also interviewed Kaganovich, and it was published in 1992. Kaganovich corroborated Molotov's statement. Here is what he said. Quote, Perhaps there was misreporting in the organs of the NKVD. Kaganovich. Exactly. This is what I would like to tell you. Was it possible to check every detail? This was indeed a most complicated question. Where we were sure of a person's innocence, we defended him. In fact, I also went by this principle. It was only twenty years after the revolution, after all. The white officers, Kulaks, and the Nepmen were all alive. Chuev. Do you think that there could have been a counter-revolutionary sabotage in the 1930s? Paganovich. Of course there was such a threat. Not only this, there were also instances of terrorism. The fifth column was at our doorstep. Without destroying them, we could not have won the war. The Germans would have beaten us to pulp. Felix Chuev. Thus spoke Kaganovich. One other point is worth mentioning. Tukhachevsky's guilt is heavily implied by documents from the German Foreign Office, discovered by historian Frederick Karsten in the 70s. However, Karsten himself, as an anti-communist historian, proposed the theory that the documents were the result of an attempt by the SS to frame Tukhachevsky, presumably to weaken the USSR and to cause destabilization. Few noteworthy things about this. If he was framed by the SS, it means the Soviets didn't deliberately frame him, but merely wrongly believed him guilty. Karsten's findings disprove the notion of Stalin framing Tukhachevsky. Some critics have claimed that the scarcity of documentary proof from the German archives of the Tukhachevsky conspiracy is proof that it wasn't real. This is a mistake in logic. In any case, even these few Karsten documents only emerged in 1974, well after Hitler's regime had collapsed. The scarcity of the German documents proves very little, and the documents we have argue in favor of the marshal's guilt. And yet, even if one dismisses all the Soviet evidence, and then dismisses the German evidence, we still have compatible and corroborative evidence from Japan, Czechoslovakia, and other sources. Collaboration with Fascism After the discovery of the Trotskyite Zinovievite plot, Nadezhna Krupskaya, Lenin's wife, an old Bolshevik and revolutionary in her own right, wrote about the subject. Quote, Trotsky is now standing on the path of organizing terrorist acts against Stalin, Voroshilov, and other members of the Politburo, who are helping the masses to build socialism. It is not a matter of chance, therefore, that the unprincipled bloc of Kamenev and Zinoviev, together with Trotsky, have pushed them from one step to another into a deep abyss of an unheard betrayal of Lenin's work, the work of the masses, the ideals of socialism. Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and their entire band of killers acted together with the German fascists, entered into a pact with the Gestapo. Krupskaya. Why is the Second International defending Trotsky? These were grave charges indeed. Trotsky from his side entirely denied all of them. After the Second World War, the leader of the Finnish communists, O. W. Kuzinen, said, quote, the ruling circles of the imperialist countries didn't limit themselves to ideological struggle against socialism. Alongside it, they engaged in provocational attacks against the Soviet Union and organized treacherous sabotage and wrecking activity, which was carried out in the production facilities of the Soviet Union by bourgeois experts, Trotskyites, Zinovievites, Bukharinites, and nationalists. End of quote. The diary of Gergi Dimitrov, supporter of Stalin, and the head of the Comintern after 1935, was published in 2003. Dimitrov met with Stalin, Molotov, Kaganovich, Voroshilov, and Orjonikids in the Kremlin regarding, among other things, the interrogation of the accused Sokolnikov. Quote, 16th December, 1936, with, quote-unquote, the five in the Kremlin, Stalin, Molotov, Kaganovich, Voroshilov, Orjonikids. Exchange of Opinions of Chinese Events The French Question Interrogation of Sokolnikov, 12th December 1936 Question 
Thus, the investigation concludes that Trotsky, abroad, and the center of the bloc within the USSR, entered into negotiations with the Hitlerite and Japanese governments with the following aims. First, to provoke a war by Germany and Japan against the USSR. Second, to promote the defeat of the USSR in that war, and to take advantage of that defeat to achieve the transfer of power in the USSR to their government bloc. Third, on behalf of the future bloc government, to guarantee territorial and economic concessions to the Hitlerite and Japanese governments. Do you confirm this? Reply. Yes, I confirm it. Question. Do you admit that this activity by the bloc is tantamount to outright treason against the motherland? Reply. Yes, I admit it. End of quote. Sokolnikov was one of the people named in the mail receipts found by Getty in Trotsky's archive, so we know he was part of Trotsky's group. His testimony verifies the fact that already came out in connection with Tukhachevsky. This information was not used in the public trial and is now available via Dimitrov's diary. The question is, would Stalin, Dimitrov, Voroshilov and others really have framed Sokolnikov? We already know Sokolnikov was at least guilty of conspiring with Trotsky, and the picture painted by Dimitrov's diary is that Stalin and others were genuinely curious about the proceedings of the NKVD investigation. Dimitrov's diary was only made public in 2003. If he wanted to lie, to cover for Stalin, he would have done so publicly, not in his personal diary that no one ever saw until the collapse of the USSR. As much of the material from the Soviet archives still remains classified, we don't have too many documents such as that, where Stalin and his associates discuss these matters privately amongst themselves. However, we do have some. In June 1937, on the eve of the Central Committee plenum, Trotsky sent a telegram to the Central Executive Committee, the highest organ of the Soviet government. In this telegram, he urged the CEC to betray Stalin and to support him. The telegram says, quote, Policy is leading to complete collapse, internal as well as external. Stop. Only salvation is radical turn towards Soviet democracy, beginning with open review of the last trials. Stop. Along this road I offer complete support. Trotsky. This telegram didn't reach the CEC before being intercepted by the NKVD, which handed it to Stalin. Upon reading it, he wrote on it the following words, quote, ugly spy, brazen spy of Hitler, end of quote. Stalin then not only signed his name under it, but gave it to Molotov, Voroshilov, Mikoyan, and Zanov. After reading the telegram, they signed their names in agreement with Stalin's assessment. If Stalin and his collaborators, Molotov, Voroshilov, etc., truly were framing Trotsky, then would they really call Trotsky a spy of Hitler, even when no one else was present? This seems unlikely. The telegram was never made public, not to mention that Stalin's and his associates' comments on it were never made public. The obvious explanation is that they truly believe Trotsky was in league with Hitler. The authenticity of the telegram has been verified. The question is, what was Trotsky's plan? It seems that he was preparing the stage for his return to power. Once the Soviet Union took heavy losses in a future war with Germany, and the Trotsky's conspirators would cause pro-Trotsky rebellions among the troops. Even having Soviet Marshal Tukhachevsky on their side, the ousted political opposition consisting of Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Smirnov, and others would take over. They would make a peace with the foreign powers, granting them heavy concessions, get rid of Stalin and his supporters, the so-called bureaucracy, and implement what Trotsky considered Soviet democracy. We also have, for instance, a written comment by Stalin criticizing the work of the NKVD upon reading the interrogation report for the accused Yakovlev's wife Sokolovskaya. According to the NKVD report, Sokolovskaya said to the interrogators, quote, During the past five years, Yakovlev has been undertaking activity participating in the underground anti-Soviet organization that stood on Trotsky's positions, end of quote. To which Stalin remarked, Quote, What's important is not Yakovlev's and Sokolovskaya's past activity, but their activity and espionage work during the past year and the recent months of 1937. We also need to know why both of these scoundrels were going abroad almost every year. J. Stalin
Once again, if Stalin and the NKVD were framing Yakovlev and Sokolovskaya, if they knew the accused were really innocent but being framed, would they behave like this? Stalin sounds genuinely interested about the activities of the accused. This comment by Stalin was never made public either. He was not acting for an audience. A further document of Stalin's comments to the NKVD regarding Yakovlev contained the following handwritten points by Stalin. 1. Did he know about Varek's service with the Tsarist secret police? 2. His opinion about Mikhailov from Voronezh and his participation in the CR org. 3. His contact with Trotsky. Did he see him personally in 1935 or in 1934? 4. How did he want to use the MOPR? Whom in MOPR did he make use of? 5. Turn Yakovlev's wife. He's a conspirator and she must tell us everything. Ask her about Stasova, Kursanova, and other friends, acquaintances of hers. End of quote. CR Org is short for Counter Revolutionary Organization. MOPR is the Internal Organization for Aid to Revolutionaries, a Soviet organization to aid communists in other countries. Obviously, Stalin believed the confessions of Yakovlev were real and not framed. Sokolnikov's and Yakovlev's wives both confessed to the crimes and were found guilty. According to Dimitrov's diary, Stalin had told him, quote, We shall probably arrest Stasova too. Turned out she's scum. Kersanova is very closely involved with Yakovlev. She's scum. End of quote. However, neither Stasova nor Kersanova were found guilty of crimes, despite Stalin's suspicions against them because they were friends with the accused. This tells us a couple of things. Firstly, that the investigation didn't simply frame anyone that Stalin personally didn't like or thought suspicious. They actually looked at the evidence and let these people go even though Stalin personally thought they were suspicious. Secondly, that Stalin obviously didn't frame the accused. He believed Yakovlev and Sokolnikov and their wives guilty of conspiracy. He also suspected Kersanova and Stasova, but the evidence didn't bear that out in the cases of the latter two. Trotsky and the Secession of Ukraine Immediately prior to the Nazi invasion of Poland, Trotsky began arguing in favor of Ukrainian secession from the USSR and rebellion against the Soviet Union. Quote, to the totalitarian bureaucracy, Soviet Ukraine became an administrative division of an economic unit and a military base of the USSR. Kremlin's attitude today is the same as it is towards all oppressed nationalities, all colonies and semi-colonies. Not a trace remains of the former confidence and sympathy of the Western Ukrainian masses for the Kremlin. Only hopeless pacifist blockheads are capable of thinking that the emancipation and unification of the Ukraine can be achieved by peaceful diplomatic means. Since the latest murderous purge in the Ukraine, in my opinion, there can be at this present time only one slogan. A united, free, independent, workers and peasants Soviet Ukraine. Trotsky problem of Ukraine. Trotsky called for a united Soviet Ukraine, but realistically all the communist forces in Ukraine supported Stalin, while the opponents of Stalin were bourgeois nationalists and fascists. What kind of sense does it make to call for Ukraine to leave the USSR as Hitler was approaching its western border? It would weaken the Soviet Union and hand Ukraine over to Hitler. In his confession in 1936, Tukhachevsky testified. During the winter of 1935-1936, Pyotrkov told me that Trotsky had now asked us to ensure the defeat of the USSR in a war, even if this meant giving Ukraine to the Germans and the Primorye to the Japanese. In order to prepare USSR defeat, all forces, both within the USSR and outside the USSR, would have to be made ready. End of quote. Hukarin confirmed this. Quote, in the summer of 1934, Radek told me that directions had been received from Trotsky, that Trotsky had already promised the Germans a number of territorial concessions, including the Ukraine. I objected to this. I considered essential that he, Radek, should write and tell Trotsky that he was going too far. This point of view of Trotsky's was politically and tactically inexpedient. Bukharin, Report of the Court Proceedings in the Case of the Anti-Soviet Bloc of Rights and Trotskyites. In his testimony, Pyotrkov, another member of the right opposition, said, quote, 
First, the German fascists promised to adopt a favorable attitude towards Trotskyite Zinovievite bloc, and to support it if it comes to power, either in the time of war or before war, should it succeed in doing so. But in return, the fascists are to receive the following compensation. A general favorable attitude towards German interests and towards German government on all questions of international policy, certain territorial concessions would have to be made, and these territorial concessions have been defined. In particular, mention was made of territorial concessions in a veiled form, which were called, quote, not resisting Ukrainian national bourgeois forces in the events of their self-determination, unquote. Vyshinsky. What does that mean? Pyotakov. It means in a veiled form what Radek spoke about here. Should the Germans set up their own Ukrainian government, ruling the Ukraine, not through their German governor-general, but perhaps through a hetman, at any rate, should the Germans, quote-unquote, self-determine the Ukraine, the Trotsky's Dinovievat bloc will not oppose it, end of quote. This truly is what would most likely have happened. If Ukraine's nationalist forces had seceded, Ukraine would have become an ally or an outright puppet regime of Nazi Germany. The notion that this kind of Ukraine would be a free Soviet Ukraine is utterly laughable. Trotskyists pointed out that there existed partisan anti-Stalin groups in Ukraine. These groups, in fact, were of course Hitlerite nationalists, not leftists. The Fourth International actually supported the OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, which fought on the side of Hitler against the USSR. They used Trotsky's writings to provide ideological justification for this. They claimed that since the OUN had split between two factions, the right wing led by Stepan Bandera and the supposed left wing led by Melnik, they were justified in defending the supposedly leftist Melnik faction. In reality, both the Banderists and the Melnikists continued to collaborate with Hitler, though had rivalries among each other. Melnik was by no means a leftist, having fought against the Soviet revolutionaries already in the Civil War and the Soviet-Ukrainian War. Petrovsky's publication, Revolutionary History, states the following, quote, To mention the Ukrainian question is commonly met with the raising of the specters of Ukrainian bourgeois nationalism and Nazi collaborators. Sadly, such prejudices run deep, and have a tradition within Marxism as far back as Engels and Luxembourg. With the rise of Stalinism, things have worsened to such a scale that it is at times difficult to get a rational and thoughtful discussion on the subject. The Ukrainian question, to quote Trotsky, is being placed on the order of the day, and this time with redoubled force. End of quote. Apparently it is Stalinism that has caused leftists to be suspicious when giving lip service to Nazi collaborators. The Trotskyists continue. Quote, in the split that occurred between the left and right of the OUN in 1940, the left moved steadily to take on socialist politics injected into it by the working class. End of quote. They even go so far as to defend the UPA, the military wing of the Nazi collaborating Melnik faction of the OUN, which carried out a policy of ethnic cleansing against Poles, Jews, and other minorities. Quote, the UPA is accused of being fascistic for the reason that during the war it waged an armed struggle against Russian Stalinism. The UPA remains one of the most unknown revolutionary movements in Soviet history, deliberately portrayed by the Stalinists as collaborators. End of quote. To these Trotskyists, the UPA is a legitimate revolutionary movement who are apparently only seen as fascistic because of alleged Stalinist propaganda. This is truly cringeworthy reading in the context of the recent Ukrainian fascist coup. These are the UPA supporters. They are Nazis. The Ukrainian militant neo-Nazi group Pravi Sector, Right Sector, has even adopted the UPA flag as their official flag. This is the result of Trotsky's writings, which state that anyone who opposes the Soviet Union with even the slightest quasi-leftist or quasi-revolutionary rhetoric is legitimate and worthy of support from the Trotskyists. Trotsky consistently used propaganda which equated Stalin with Hitler, or saying that Stalin was worse than Hitler, blaming Soviet communism for Hitler, and legitimizing opponents of the Soviet Union who, in the case of Ukraine, would be OUN fascists. In his article on Ukraine, he employed an interesting propaganda tactic. At first, Trotsky seems to be criticizing Hitler, but in fact, he's only criticizing Stalin. 
putting all the blame on Stalin and saying that Hitler is only an outcome of Soviet crimes. Quote, but for the rape of Soviet Ukraine by the Stalinist bureaucracy, there would be no Hitlerite Ukrainian policy. Trotsky, problem of the Ukraine. It is not at all surprising that Trotsky would make criticisms of Nazism even as he was helping Hitler. He was entirely willing to lie and do whatever it took to achieve his aims. Moreover, in their substance, his policies were not anti-Hitler but anti-Soviet and pro-Hitler. Of course, Trotsky had no personal love for Hitler, nor did Hitler like the Jew Trotsky, but they were useful for each other as they shared a common enemy. Analysis of Trotsky's Political Propaganda Quote, Adolf Hitler read Trotsky's autobiography as soon as it was published. Hitler's biographer, Konrad Haydn, tells in Der Führer how the Nazi leader surprised the circle of his friends in 1930 by bursting into rapturous praise of Trotsky's book. Brilliant, cried Hitler, waving Trotsky's my life at his followers. I have learned a great deal, and so can you. Kahn and Sayers, the great conspiracy against Russia. Trotsky's open political propaganda was naturally different from his clandestine conspiratorial activity. However, both were meant to serve the same end, topple the Soviet government led by Stalin. Tacit support for fascism. Anything that Trotsky said openly has to be looked at with skepticism, as he was a proven liar. But we can learn some things from his statements. For instance, when he made a weak criticism of Nazism, it is obvious he was not being honest, as he was collaborating with fascists himself. Still, he was not a fascist, and of course disliked fascism, but still saw it as a convenient ally against the bigger enemy, Stalin's government. For this reason, even as he criticized fascism, he emphasized how the Soviet Union was essentially as bad, or typically even worse than fascism, and tried to put the blame for fascist crimes on the Soviet Union. This would also help him seem like a genuine anti-fascist, and not a collaborator even though he was one. What better plan to remove suspicion from himself than to accuse everyone else and claim to be the biggest anti-fascist of all? Quote, In the last period, the Soviet bureaucracy has familiarized itself with many traits of victorious fascism, Trotsky on the eve of the Congress. Quote, the Comintern bureaucracy, together with social democracy, is doing everything it possibly can to transform Europe, in fact the entire world, into a fascist concentration camp. Trotsky. Obviously this statement is baseless, as the USSR was the biggest enemy of fascism, not only in words, but also in actions. Fighting against fascist Franco in 1936, fascist Japan in 1938 and 39, and in World War II, and obviously, it was Stalin's USSR that defeated Hitler's armies. Interestingly, Trotsky here attacks social democracy too, while he would later attack Stalin for not supporting social democracy enough. Quote, Hitler's victory arose by the despicable and criminal policy of the Comintern. No Stalin, no victory for Hitler. Stalinist Comintern, as well as the Stalinist diplomacy, assisted Hitler into the saddle from either side. The Comintern provided one of the most important conditions for the victory of fascism. To overthrow Hitler, it is necessary to finish with the Comintern. Workers learn to despise this bureaucratic rabble. Trotsky, are there limits to the fall? Here, Trotsky is demanding the destruction of the Communist International, but disguises this as a leftist position. He says to overthrow Hitler, he must destroy the Comintern. This is a ridiculous statement, as in reality, to destroy the Comintern was to aid and unite with Hitler and his anti-Comintern. Trotsky of course knew this. These writings by him were merely a tactic to fool his supporters, who would have never done so otherwise, into opposing Soviet socialism and aiding Hitler. Tacit support for terrorism When it comes to Trotsky's statements surrounding the Kirov murder, we can notice a few basic components. Trotsky essentially said Kirov got what he deserved. He briefly stated he was opposed to terrorism, but obviously didn't condemn this murder in any strong words. Quite the opposite, he voiced tacit support for it. Quote, a terrorist act, prepared beforehand and committed by order of a definite organization, is inconceivable unless there exists a political atmosphere favorable to it. 
the hostility to the leaders in power must have been widespread and must have assumed the sharpest form for a terrorist group to crystallize out within the ranks of the party youth. If discontent is spreading within the masses of the people, which isolated the bureaucracy as a whole, if the youth feels itself that it is spurned, oppressed and deprived of the chance for independent development, the atmosphere for terroristic groupings is created. Trotsky on the Kurov assassination Trotsky said in no uncertain terms that the Soviet government Kirov was serving was so oppressive it spawned resistance from the workers. He continued to insist that the murder was carried out by worker oppositionists whom Trotsky considered legitimate. This is interesting as Trotsky would later, after his plot failed and his organization was crushed, accuse Stalin of orchestrating the murder of Kirov himself. Quote, the reactionary bureaucracy must and will be overthrown. The political revolution in the USSR is inevitable. Trotsky One might ask how this statement is to be interpreted in context with the assassinations. According to Trotsky, Kirov was a Stalinist bureaucrat who even deserved to be killed. Quote, the insane atrocities provoked by the bureaucratic collectivization methods or the cowardly reprisals against the best elements of the proletarian vanguard have inevitably provoked exasperation hatred and a spirit of vengeance. This atmosphere generates a readiness among the youth to commit individual acts of terror. Trotsky This kind of vitriol against the USSR seems hardly any strong condemnation of the terrorists. Quite the opposite, he makes every excuse for the terrorists and is very understanding towards their plight under Soviet rule. Trotsky says in no uncertain terms that he saw the attack as a form of resistance by the oppressed citizens. Indeed, by a resistance group. The thing he didn't say, of course, is that he was leading said group. Overt Support for the Overthrow of the Soviet Union Quote, The proletariat that made three revolutions will lift up its head one more time. The bureaucratic absurdity will try to resist. The proletariat will find a big enough broom and we will help it. Leon Trotsky Trotsky calls for an insurrection against the Soviet Union. But who were leading these insurrections? Kulaks, whites, bourgeois nationalists, and Banderite Nazis. He is quite clear. This resistance work against the Soviet Union is to be continued and is to be organized inside the USSR. Quote, I cannot be for the USSR in general. I am for the working masses who created the USSR and against the bureaucracy which has usurped the gains of the revolution. It remains the duty of a serious revolutionary to state quite frankly and openly, Stalin is preparing the defeat of the USSR. Trotsky Here Trotsky chooses a softer tone. He claims to be helping the Soviet Union and that it is not him who is sabotaging its defenses in favor of fascism, but Stalin. Quote, Only the overthrow of the Bonapartist Kremlin clique can make possible the regeneration of the military strength of the USSR. The struggle against war, imperialism, and fascism demands a ruthless struggle against Stalinism, splashed with crimes. Whoever defends Stalinism, directly or indirectly, whoever keeps silent about its betrayals or exaggerates its military strength, is the worst enemy of the revolution, or socialism, of the oppressed peoples. Trotsky Whoever supports the Soviet government or the Communist International, even indirectly, is according to Trotsky, the worst enemy of socialism. So Hitler, in fact, is better, as he does not support either of those things. Trotsky embraces the company of Hitler. Quote, I consider the main source of danger to the USSR in the present international situation to be Stalin and the oligarchy headed by him. An open struggle against them is inseparably connected for me with the defense of the USSR. Trotsky Apparently, in Trotsky's mind, an open struggle against the Soviet government would strengthen its defenses. Obviously, the main danger to the USSR was a foreign invasion. Invasion which Trotsky was in fact supporting and even counting on. Trotsky, Japan and China Vyshinsky What did you and Trotsky say about your underground Trotskyite tasks? Besanov he imposed on his followers, working in the diplomatic field, the task of adopting the line of sabotaging official agreements in order to stimulate the interests of the Germans in unofficial agreements with opposition groups. They will come to us yet, 
said Trotsky, referring to Hess and Rosenberg. He said that we must not be squeamish in this matter, and that we might be insured real and important help from Hess and Rosenberg. He said we must not stop short at consenting to big sessions of territory. End of quote. Radek. As regards Japan, we were told she must not only be given Sakhalin oil, but be guaranteed oil in the event of a war with the USA. It was stated that no obstacles must be raised to the conquest of China by Japanese imperialism. End of quote. In their testimony, some defendants explained that on top of promising territorial concessions, mainly in Ukraine, to Germany, Trotsky was also promising concessions to Japan, access to natural resources, favorable trade, and perhaps most importantly of all, Trotsky would guarantee Japan freedom of activity in China and sabotage the pro-Stalin communist forces there. On Trotsky had sabotage activity in China, Mao Zedong wrote. Quote, in the central districts of Hebei, the Trotskyists organized a partisan company on the direct instructions of the Japanese headquarters and call it a second section of the 8th Army. In March, the two battalions of this company organized a mutiny, but these bandits were surrounded by the 8th Army and disarmed. In the border regions, such people are arrested by the peasant self-defense units, which carry out a bitter struggle against traitors and spies. Trotskyist agents are being sent to the border regions, where they systematically apply all methods in their sabotage work against the cooperation of the Kuomintang and the Communist Party. Mao Zedong, on the use of Trotskyists as Japanese spies in China. Ho Chi Minh, also working with the Chinese Communist Party at the time, wrote, In the past, in my eyes and those of a good number of comrades, Trotskyism seemed a matter of a struggle between tendencies within the Chinese Communist Party. That is why we hardly paid it any attention. But a little before the outbreak of the war, more exactly since the end of the year 1936, and notably during the war, the criminal propaganda of the Trotskyists opened our eyes. The Chinese Trotskyists, like the Trotskyists of other countries, do not represent a political group, much less a political party. They are nothing but a band of evildoers, the running dogs of Japanese fascism and of international fascism. Ho Chi Minh Trotsky, Spain and Italy Quote, Trotsky is the whore of fascism. Antonio Gramsci. In his testimony, accused Krestinsky said, Trotsky arrived in Meran, Italy, around the 10th of October together with Sedov. For Trotsky, the questions which bothered us in Moscow were irrevocably settled and he himself proceeded to expound his instructions with regard to this. He said that, as since 1929 we had developed into an organization of a conspiratorial type, it was natural that the seizure of power could be consummated only by force. End of quote. Leon Trotsky visited the Roman ruins near Naples, Italy, before proceeding to Denmark for a lecture tour, the Cornell Daily Sun, December 1932. As the Italian communist leader Antonio Gramsci rotted in Mussolini's prison, Leon Trotsky was walking around quite freely. After leaving Italy, Trotsky traveled to Denmark to give a series of speeches. It is interesting to note that although he ostensibly called for the overthrow of the Soviet Union by the Soviet working class themselves, he chose to give his speeches in English. In other words, his real objective was to convince the Western audience. These statements by Trotsky were widely published in the West. Recordings were even made. M. Trotsky in Denmark. Lecture broadcast to America. Barrier Minor, 30th November, 1932. Trotsky knew his support among the Soviet workers was insignificant at the time. This is the main reason for him abandoning popular revolutionary struggle in favor of conspiracy. He wrote, One fights repression by means of anonymity and conspiracy. Loss of time is impermissible. Trotsky, 1932. Trotsky sent his secretary, Erwin Wolf, to Spain on a mission to organize an uprising there. The pro-Trotskyite and anti-Soviet Poom carried out an insurrection known as the Barcelona May Day in 1937. As Franco-Italian troops were marching against the Republicans, the Trotskyists and their unwitting helpers staged a rebellion against Republican forces. The rebellion was a failure and Wolf was arrested by the Spanish police. However, this anti-Republican uprising contributed to the victory of fascist Franco backed by Mussolini and Hitler. <laughs>
Industrial sabotage. Many of the Moscow trial defendants were accused of industrial sabotage to hinder the industrialization effort and defensive capability of the Soviet Union. Even these charges are denied entirely by Western anti-communists. However, at the time there was little doubt that there was much real sabotage going on. John Littlepage, American engineer who worked between 1928 and 1937 in the mines of Ural and Siberia. He was chosen as a specialist for a commission which was to carry out inspections in the mining enterprises. He described the extent of the sabotage. Quote, in 1928, I went into a power station at the Kobar gold mines. I just happened to drop my hand on one of the main bearings of a large diesel engine as I walked by and felt something gritty in the oil. I had the engine stopped immediately and we removed from the oil reservoir about two pints of quartz sand, which could have only been placed there by design. On several other occasions in the new milling plants at Kobar, we found sand inside such equipment as speed reducers, which are entirely enclosed and can be reached only by removing the handhold covers. Such petty industrial sabotage was, and still is, so common in all branches of Soviet industry that Russian engineers can do little about it. I shall never forget the situation we found at Katala, here in the northern Urals, was one of the most important copper properties in Russia, consisting of six mines, a flotation concentrator, and a smelter, with blast and reverberatory furnaces. In the spring of 1932, soon after my return to Moscow, I was informed that the copper mines at Katala were in very bad condition. Production had fallen, even lower than it was before I reorganized the mines in the previous year. This report dumbfounded me. I couldn't understand how matters could have become so bad in this short a time, when they had seemed to be going so well before I left. I never followed the subtleties of political ideas and maneuvers, but I am firmly convinced that Stalin and his associates were a long time getting around to the discovery that disgruntled communist revolutionaries were the most dangerous enemies they had. My experience confirms the official explanation which, when it is stripped of a lot of high-flown and outlandish verbiage, comes down to the simple assertion that outs among the communists conspired to overthrow the inns and resorted to underground conspiracy and industrial sabotage. John D. Littlepage, In Search of Soviet Gold. Pyatakov explained in his testimony that when he was responsible for purchasing various mining equipment for the Soviet government, he had used this, under Sedov's instructions, as a way of embezzling money for the use of the Trotsky's block by buying equipment at too high a price from two specifically selected German companies, Borzig and DMAG. Quote, Sedov said that only one thing was required of me, that I should place as many orders as possible with two German firms, Borzig and DMAG, and that he, Sedov, would arrange to receive the necessary sums from them. Pyotrkov, USSR Report of Court Proceedings in the case of the anti-Soviet Trotsky at Center. This too was corroborated by Littlepage, who at the time had made a report to the committee led by Pyotrkov that the firms were apparently trying to trick the Soviets into paying too much. Quote, Pyotrkov's confession is a plausible explanation, in my opinion, of what was going on in Berlin in 1931, when my suspicions were roused because the Russians working with Pyotrkov tried to induce me to approve the purchase of mine hoists which were not only too expensive, but would have been useless in the mines for which they were intended. John D. Littlepage, In Search of Soviet Gold. John Scott, another American engineer, working in the Magnitokorsk steel complex, wrote of his experiences in his book, Behind the Urals. Scott verified that there was much real sabotage in Magnitogorsk, especially because of the use of bourgeois specialists and kulak penal labor. He said, quote, White armies, state employees from pre-war days, businessmen of all kinds, small landlords and kulaks. All of these people had ample reason to hate the Soviet power, for it deprived them of something which they had had before. Besides being internally dangerous, these men and women were potentially good material for clever foreign agents to work with." End of quote. 